You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Welcome to the Choose If I radio podcast. Today on the show, we are going to be interviewing Captain DIY, also known as Tinian Crawford. He is going to be helping us explore this tradesperson path to financial independence. And I think this is a fascinating conversation. I've seen this survey posted in multiple communities. I've seen it in the financial independence community on Reddit. I've seen it on MrMoneyMustache.com and on the forums. And certainly I've seen it in our own Facebook group several times, a survey trying to figure out what types of jobs are represented by the financial independence community. And unsurprisingly, there are a lot of those, a lot of those jobs that seem to be highly represented. Doctors, lawyers, engineers, teachers actually show up surprisingly high. But one that doesn't seem to show up as much is the tradescraft, tradespersons. It seems like it's a glaring oversight because there's so much opportunity here. So today we wanted to circle back to that. We've talked about it on the blog Today, we wanted to circle back and go a little bit deeper. And to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan. I'm doing great. And yeah, you're right. This is both an oversight and an opportunity. That's the beautiful part is when we notice things that we haven't discussed or we haven't dove into, we get to talk about it, right? And Tinian is the perfect person, Captain DIY. I just love that moniker. I, I chuckle every time I hear it. It's just, it's brilliant. And this is really an opportunity for us to discuss jobs that are high paying, in demand, and will exist probably for eternity, right? We talk about jobs that are potentially going away, but these are jobs we need. So Tinian, with that, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, the Captain DIY moniker. I made up kind of tongue in cheek, but people seem to love it. So I'm sticking with it. (laughs) That is a way that a lot of monikers are crafted and created. I'm I'm positive that that is what happened with Big Earn. So uh, you're in good company. One of the things I wanted to highlight, so I did some DIY electric work and it came to my attention that um, I may have done it slightly incorrectly, which it seems like it's kind of high risk when you do electrical work incorrectly. But I noticed (laughs) On this article that you wrote, Making a Case for Learning a Trade, you had this image, and at the top it says electrician's rates, minimum rate, $70 an hour. If you watch me, it's $100 an hour. If you help me, it's $150 an hour, and correcting your mistakes, $250 an hour. So one, I was laughing I was laughing because I've certainly made some mistakes trying to do my own DIY electric, but two, even at the bottom end of that tier, it's a pretty high hourly rate. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny. I've had a few calls of people trying to get me over to their house to, you know, they said a carpenter took out my light switches while he was fixing the walls and now he can't put them back together again. And, you know, I just go walk into a mess that I have no idea of what to do with. And I I have to walk away. There's nothing I can do for him. But going back to the uh, base salary there, it's pretty amazing what people are happy to pay to have a professional come and take care of their house for them. And uh, $70 an hour in my area in the Northeast is actually a pretty cheap rate for an electrician. You will not find anybody that's going to be giving you work for $70 an hour. So Tinian, $70 an hour at a minimum. And yet these trades jobs do not show up on the Mr. Money Mustache survey of professions for people in the FI community. Have you ever thought of, of why that's the case? You know, in the trades community, there seems to be a a high rate of consumerism. Um, Certainly, you can see it in terms of vehicles. You look at the average trade person, they're going to be driving an enormous vehicle that's probably very new and extremely expensive. It's just a culture of spending money in the trades. You make the money, it's easy to spend it. So there's a spending side. Is there any type of, in, in your experience, is there any type of financial education at all? Or is this just, hey, we're throwing 
from college into training programs into a 70 plus dollar an hour job. How does that work? I mean, that's that's a pretty big change. Yeah. And certainly in a lot of cases, people are going to trade school in high school. You know, they go to vocational schools and uh, in those vocational schools, they're certainly learning English and math and all the general classes that we take in regular high school. But on top of that, they're adding the trade specific work and there's really no room for financial work on top of that. Uh, and so there's there's very little financial education in the community. But we have you here on this show, and obviously, you know, you have embraced this idea of financial independence, and you're on the path. Let's go back and get a little backstory. Was it for you, like as a kid, was it always trades? It was never trades for me as a kid. I mean, I helped my dad. My dad is, uh, I like to call him OG Fi, because he's a he's an old <laughs> Yankee hippie from back in the day. Wait a he, second. Wait, wait, I, I want to get all the details, but let's just make a note of the timestamp. Brad, we have to lock that term down. <laughs> <laughs> OG Fi. Love it. I had to throw it in there somewhere. So when he and my mother were still together, they separated when I was two, and the two of them bought a house in a community in the middle of the woods in Western Massachusetts, and the house was falling apart. So they tore it down. They built it back up again. And once my mother moved out, they, my dad started expanding it. And from there, he built uh, a barn for a storage area. Eventually, he built a goat barn. He didn't have a flush toilet for many years until the inspector got wind of that and forced him to put one in. So he installed all the plumbing in the house. And Learn yeah, the he trades just, as you need them. Exactly. Yep. He figured it out as he went. So this clearly was pre YouTube days. How did he learn that? And, and how involved were you in this process? If at all, I think he mostly learned it through trial and error. There was certainly some structures that were not built beautifully, but you know, they hold. And I was definitely involved with it as a kid, mostly because uh, I didn't have a choice. If I ever made the mistake of telling him that I was bored, I would soon end up with a hammer in my hand, standing <laughs> on top of scaffolding working on the siding on the barn. So it's, I was definitely involved with it. I think your Facebook picture still has that hammer in it. It's the same hammer. <laughs> Never been bored since. <laughs> That's right. And my kids know not to say that they're bored too. Nice. Let's talk. You said I was never going to do the trades. That was not even on your plate. What was the plan? So I was always told that I was artistic and I sort of believed it. I like to draw. I like to play music. And so I always planned on doing something that was more artistically oriented. So after high school, and actually, if I could go back to high school, I went to a performing arts charter high school, which is about as far away from a trades path as you can get. Uh, it was a focus on music. And so after that, I went to community colleges because that was the thing to do. And the only thing that I could think of to study was graphic design. Community colleges. I, I want to stop on that real quick, just because... Jonathan went to community college for a few years and, and you obviously did, but that was the thing to do. That was the quote you just said. And that's interesting because in, in some areas of the country that is highly recommended and in some areas people look down their nose at community colleges, which I think is absurd, frankly, but talk me through, did other members of your high school where did a lot of your friends go directly to community college? No. And, and actually, when I say that was the thing to do, I'm really referring to just college in general. Some of my friends were taking community college classes while they were in high school, kind of a dual enrollment sort of thing. And several of them went on to further degrees. And, you know, some of my friends are mechanical engineers and sound engineers, but, but really most of them kind of found their path earlier on and went off to study it. Whereas I, I went to community college just because I needed to do something at that time. So you're in community college for graphic design. What's the play here? Do you graduate with that associate's degree and get a job in that field? <laughs> so uh, it took me six years to get my degree because I, I just kind of drifted in and out of classes. I wasn't really attracted to the classes at all. And, you know, it was fun learning Photoshop and Illustrator. I was never very good at it. And also just sitting in front of a computer all day seemed so unpleasant to me that I couldn't. I couldn't really wrap my head into it and really get excited about it. Yeah, I think a lot of us certainly feel that regardless of, of what our job is. It just seems unnatural to sit at a computer all day at a desk, even if you have an office, right? It's still just, it's unnatural. So yeah, I totally hear you there. And I'm curious, you said Photoshop and Illustrator. Those are items that are used in this new economy, right? In building websites. And 
do you find any value for them today? Like I know obviously you've you've taken a circuitous path from graphic designer to tradesperson to now you've created your own website. And we're always talking about that talent stack of things that you might learn along the way and they might not have this value for you that day, but someday down the road they might or they do. Have you seen that in your own life? So I haven't actually used Photoshop or Illustrator in probably 20 years now, but what I have found has helped me with my website development is just that designer's eye. It's it's the training that I got in figuring out how to find the best fonts and things that just might be helpful for building something that looks good. That's definitely helped me out quite a bit, I think. You know, we've talked about this idea of this jungle gym path towards a career. It doesn't always need to be linear. I think so many of us feel like if it isn't linear, if it's not always going up, then that is failure. Uh, I don't really know if that's accurate. I know we were talking to Millennial Boss and she highlighted a very compelling case for this jungle gym path to your career. But I'm curious, obviously, you're not working in Photoshop and Illustrator now. You're in a tradescraft. How do we get there? So when I got out of community college, when I finally ended up with my degree, I was looking for a job that I could get that was at least marginally in that field. And the closest thing I ended up with was a job in the sign business, which was using some of my design skills, but it was mostly in the manufacturing aspect. So I I wasn't really getting to use my creative skills as much as I wanted to. Um, In signs, there are a lot of signs that have electricity in them because they're they're lit signs, you know, they're backlit and there's facelit and all these different types. And I had the thought in my head that since I'm not making a whole lot of money here, I might be worth more if I got an electrical license and then I could sell myself as having a focus in the electrical aspect of the sign industry. Now, how are you aware specifically, like you said, I I thought that I would make more if I got to the electrical side. Did you know other individuals that were electricians? Because frankly, I have no concept of what plumbers, what electricians, what some, you know, of these different trades, what they actually make. Were you exposed to that? I had no idea. Honestly, I, I didn't know anybody who was an electrician. I didn't know anybody in the sign field who had done anything like that. It just kind of popped into my head that I was stuck here making $13 an hour and there was really nowhere to go. What else can I do to make more money? So what did you do? I actually didn't do anything. Um, My wife heard me talking about this stuff. And the next thing I know, I start getting emails from local vocational schools. I I call them aftermarket (laughs) schools. So before Amazon and Facebook were listening to your conversations, uh, your (laughs) wife was. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Uh, So I went to check out an open house at a school probably a week or so after I started getting these emails, because I, I thought, well, you know, why not? I, I'm not doing anything else. I didn't have any kids at the time. And so I went and checked it out. It was pretty close by. I liked what I saw and I signed up right there and it was a year long program. So let me just get this straight. Was your associate's degree, was that required to go to this electric school? Would you have needed a high school GED? I'm just wondering, I mean, I think what we've described, there's a little bit of drift here. You didn't really know exactly what you wanted to do. It took a while to get this. But once you had it in your sights, it's a one year program. But let's just say someone heard this episode and it lit a spark and they said, yes, I want to do that. What would they have needed to just go directly to this program? Basically, you need a pulse and a pen. They will pretty (laughs) much take anybody. (laughs) All right. So a pulse and a pen and it's a one year program. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's other types of programs. There's uh, programs that you can do while you're working that take a little bit longer So one of the options I looked at was through the local electrical union, which they would provide the classes. It was, let me see, it was a 10 year commitment. So it was five years of working as an apprentice and going to classes in the evenings, which I believe it was two or three evenings out of the week. You were going to classes for those five years. And then afterwards, you would promise to give them five years of work as a licensed electrician. Okay. So that's a pretty big disparity between the two. One is like this one year path and you're done. And the other is this 10 year path. Did you think through the pros and the cons of each? I mean, was there, how much was the one year program? So the one year program that I ended up going with was $25,000. So it was a little bit pricey and the other path, it was $10,000, but then you get that money back. So it, it would have ended up not really costing me anything. 
So weighing out the pros and cons, I, I kind of looked into it and talked through some people that had gone through the union program. And what I had heard was a little bit disparaging that the apprentices tended to get laid off pretty often because they needed to have a certain amount of apprentices. And so it was really hard for people to actually get their hours in because you need to get a certain amount of hours before you can take the license test. So people weren't really getting enough time to get their license test in. So I, I decided against that path. So you've paid $25,000 for this program one year. Are you a licensed electrician? Do you have to go for this testing? And then what does that enable you to get job-wise? Like I'm thinking about someone in the audience who's saying, wow, you mean I can take one year of this program and get a job that makes $70 per hour or, or more? But I just want to dial into that. What realistically could someone expect from? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's definitely not that fast of a path. One year gives you the classroom hours. It gives you a few of the field hours, but you need to do a five-year apprenticeship, really. So what this did for me was it got me in the door with some contractors because it's a one-year program, but they break it up into quarters. In between every quarter, there's a one-week period where you're expected to do an internship. So what I did, uh, the first break, I did an internship at electrical supply store. And that was probably the most boring week of my life. And the second one, I ended up having a job fall through, so I didn't have anything. And one of my instructors asked me about it. He says, oh, you know, it, it sounds like you don't have anything going. I said, I had something going and it, and it totally fell through on me. So he says, well, you know, it, I used to work for a guy. Let me give him a call. And so he called up a contractor who said, sure, I'll take him, send him over. So I worked for this contractor for a week for free. And at the end of the week, he said, hey, do you want to come in on Monday? And I said, absolutely, I do. And that was it. So you're describing a five-year apprenticeship, which to me, in my mind's eye, sounds like this really formal process, right? But it's not four and a half years. It's not five and a half years. It's five years. A, is that true? Am I getting the right sense? And B, then you're describing somewhat of this informality of, oh, I met this contractor and then he hooked me up with this other guy. Again, I'm really just trying to get a sense of like that actionable tip of like someone who wants to do this and just get a true understanding of what this is going to look like for them, at least for the next six years, right? As we're describing. And so, so yeah, talk me through that apprenticeship and how it works. Sure. So it's basically just getting a job. I mean, my job interview was giving this guy one week of free labor and then I had a job. So as a first year apprentice, you're not going to be making a whole lot of money right off the bat. I mean, I started at seven fifty an hour, which was a huge drop from where I had been, but that didn't last very long. It was a couple of weeks before I started moving up and it was basically just testing me to see if I really wanted to stay in this field. And so from there, it was basically just an electrical job and I was working under the tutelage of a licensed electrician. So I just kind of followed him around and he taught me what he knew and I helped him out on jobs and learn from there. It was kind of a learn by doing sort of thing, which really worked for me because I, I have a hard time learning from reading a book. I have a much easier time learning with my hands. And that's really how the apprenticeship is set up is you learn with your hands. Gotcha. So five years, did you stay with this same electrician or did you move around ultimately? And, and what do people do normally, I guess? So I stayed with the same electrician and that is the normal path for an apprentice. It's just, it's easy to stay with the same electrician, especially if you find somebody that has solid work and doesn't lay people off too often. I was lucky to find somebody that has never laid anybody off in three generations of ownership of this company. And so it just worked out pretty well. Although I did barely skate through the 2008 crash without getting laid off. That was, a, that was a close call. I heard later on that I was, I was about a week away from getting laid off. Oh, wow. All right. So let's plot this out. I, I'm fascinated. And I think our audience is fascinated by the economics and we've highlighted how bad the economics are for the individual that is doing the four-year degree and then coming out and not having the job waiting for them in the presence of looming, ever-growing student loan debt. And so, I mean, I think we've hit that ad nauseum that it's suboptimal. I think it would be a disservice not to kind of paint what this optimized path would actually look like since you're relatively familiar with the numbers, at least when you went through the program and you could probably help us figure out what it would look like right now. So the individual that now has the benefit of Tenny and coaching them through the process and helping guide them from 
doing this apprentice program, this five-year path. Would you just explore this with me and let's kind of map out what this financial process would look like, what they could expect from an income perspective and what their cost would be? Sure. When you're starting off, it's going to be a little bit tight. It's You're not going to be making a ton of money right off the bat, but that does go up. I mean, like I said, I started at 750 an hour. That went up pretty quickly from there. Within the first year, I was up to 1050 an hour. And then by the second year, I had gone back up to the 13 an hour that I was making previously. By the end of my apprenticeship, I was making $15 an hour. And then the day after I got my license, my pay jumped 50%. All right. So the one year program that you took cost $25,000. Did you take out a student loan for that? I did. Yes. Okay. So you have your $25,000 student loan debt and now you're in this program for one year. So you're not making anything in during that year that you're in the program. Then you come out and the first year you're making, I think you said 750 and then let's just assume the next year 10 and then the third year you were making, uh, what, 13, you said, and then after you graduated, you immediately had a 50% jump. So you're up near $20 an hour as soon as you get your license in year five. Is that what I understood you to say? That's basically right. The only thing I would add to that is that I actually was working during that year program because the, the way they have it set up is pretty well set up for people who have jobs. It was You had, could have a choice between um, taking a morning class, which went from 7.30 to 12, which is what I did, or you could do an afternoon class, which went... 12.30 to 4-ish, and then there was also evening classes where you could work a regular 9 to 5 and then go to these evening classes. So I was working in the afternoons while I was doing this program, so I was able to make some money and start paying off those loans right away. Okay, that is absolutely fascinating. So I think I think it would just be so much fun just to kind of plot this path out financially for someone who hasn't considered it. So let's assume that year that you're actually working and I guess you were working, you were making, you said $13 an hour, right? During the year that you were also going to the school. When I started the program, I was still working for the sign company. So I was still making $13 an hour for the first half of the program. Okay. So one of the things that's very interesting to me about, like you said, I'm not good with books. I'm, I, I prefer to learn with my hands. Now what that means to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is all of the work that you're doing, all the study that you're doing is inside that four hour window. You're not going home and reading books and studying. I think sometimes people that are in academia, some of the fear when they're going to school is yes, they're learning while they're in school, but that's followed up with hours and hours of research or reading books. And and then there's that fear that because they, they can't get a job while they're working because they need that time to study. It's not just school, it's school and study. It would it be accurate to say that there isn't as much of that fear when you're going to a trade school. You're just at school while you're at school. And when you're not there, there's not as much take home work. Absolutely. The reading material basically consists of the electrical code book, which if you have a hard time sleeping, I recommend it. It's uh, <laughs> definitely not something you sit down and, and thumb through. Okay. So for an individual that has a full-time job, maybe it's a below median income job, but they're thinking about pursuing this path. There's a very real possibility that even if the education cost $25,000, they could probably pay down a percentage of that while they're in the program from there on out. So while the other individuals are maybe taking out 25, 30,000 per year for four years, after this first year, you're actually earning income at probably now that's probably moved up a little bit because this is back in 2008. So probably you're going to be earning over $10 an hour. And by the end of year five, close to $20 an hour at the end of year five, when you're licensed, how do we get from $20 an hour up to $70 an hour? So $70 an hour really doesn't come from working for somebody. The best thing about being in a trade is it's incredibly easy to start your own business. I mean, the the day I had my license, I had people calling me, asking me to do work at their house. And really, every time I meet anybody and they find out what I do for work, inevitably, the conversation goes to, well, you know, I have some electrical work I need done at my house. Can you come over and do it for me? And uh, so... I was doing that for a long time. I was charging $50 an hour and thinking I was ripping people off. My wife said, no, 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 you're charging way too little. They charge way more than that. So she went and called them How does she know that? Who is they? (laughs) So they would be all of the other electricians who are owning their own businesses. And there's a reputation that electricians make piles of money. So she felt like I wasn't making enough money compared to what she had heard. (laughs) So she called around to a bunch of different electricians and, you know, came up with a job and said, Oh, I need this done. What, what do you charge per hour? And 
the replies that she got were, you know, minimum $85 an hour for one guy. Usually they send a licensed electrician and a apprentice and they charge you at least $135 an hour for the two of them. So after that, I had to bump my rates up. Tinny, and I am curious about sort of starting your own business, but is this like a side business for many people? Do do most electricians in your experience, do they keep that that day job, if you will, like the the working for somebody else? Or do they take this, hey, I'm going to start my own business and just do that right away? Like how how would one navigate this in a perfect world? I guess on day one, you don't have any clients, right? You have no business. You maybe put your number in the phone book or get a website for you know, a one page website or something, but you have no clients, right? So you're not earning any money on day one. Do you see many people shifting into their own business or like, how do, how does that generally work? So most of what I've seen, and I'd, I'd say generally it's probably a 50, 50 split roughly between people who stay with a day job and people who start their own business. And what I've seen, I've seen several instances of this, of people starting their own business is people are working in the field. They're working their day job. And on the side, in the evenings and the weekends, they are helping out friends and family with jobs who then spread the word to their friends and family and word goes on from there. I mean, so I can tell you that this month I have turned down more jobs than I've taken because I just simply don't have the time to do them all. And I have done absolutely zero advertising. I really like bringing up numbers when I can, but just assuming that you're making $75 an hour, I think it's probably key to highlight that if you don't have... You know, if you don't have a nine to five, then it's not necessarily that you are working eight hours in a row every single day for the individual that's just getting started. There could be space in, and it's one to two hour jobs at a time. And it's how many of those you could stack together. But even assuming inefficiency compared to like a W2 job, if you're making $75 an hour and you're able to get 20 hours a week, I mean, that's 78 K that's real money. Absolutely. And you do have to remember that you have to pay for insurance and you know a vehicle and things like that and, and of course you have to there's some tool overhead to get started but really to get started in the trades you can just take the smaller simple jobs that only require the same tools that you had to buy for your day job uh, and so it's pretty easy to kind of just chip away at the tool list and have a job pay for the next tool you know oh, i need a i need a bandsaw that's 300 dollars. well this job is going to pay me $600 to do the job. So it's totally worth it for me to buy this bandsaw for this job. So Tinian, let's say you're advising an 18 year old family friend who's interested in getting into the trades. It doesn't have to be an electrician, but just for argument's sake, we'll say electrician. So what do you think is the path for the next, I don't know, 12, 15 years? Like what's the prototypical path? I would say once you have gotten into an apprenticeship, right, you have to stay working for somebody during your apprenticeship until you get licensed. And then from there, I would recommend sticking with a day job for a little while, unless you just have so many people knocking down your door that you can run off on your own. But it's always good to get a little bit more experience working under somebody so that you you feel confident in the workforce. In fact, I still have a day job. I work for a local university. Having that comfort of the day job really allows you to take the jobs that you want to take on the side business. So if I had somebody asking me what I recommended for them to start in the trades. I would suggest finding a decent contractor to work for, somebody that's going to give you a pretty wide array of experience in the field. Stick with them for a while as long as you're comfortable and as long as they're treating you well. And just hang on to that and take some of those jobs on the side because it's it's going to happen. You're going to get people calling you for work. There's no way around it. So you might as well have some fun with it and you might as well do it while you have the safety net of having a day job. We're talking about electrician just as happenstance, because that is the particular trade that you followed in. But I, I'm curious, as a person in the trades, does this model expand? Are there other ones that immediately come to mind? And we're going to leave somebody out and somebody's going to say you missed this. But just like if you were going to give me five or six more that would follow this kind of similar profile, what else would you highlight for our community? So I was thinking about different ways that people could do this without as much overhead in the beginning. And there are certainly several examples of trades that people could get into that don't require licenses that you could get into right away and start making money. Um, for example, garden and landscaping and design. I mean, it's, that's a lucrative field. People can make $50,000 a year doing that. And that's something you can dive right into. You don't need a license to do it. You can just find somebody 
that can teach you some skills and some tricks, or, you know, you can go on YouTube and find some YouTube tricks, just dive into it, start doing some stuff, do your yard, make it look really nice, take some pictures and put it online. So Tenny, we hear the phrase trades. I think immediately it pops to mind plumber and electrician and maybe carpenter or contract. I, I, I don't want to misuse phrases, but what does the trades mean to you? I can't say that I've ever seen any specific definition on what exactly is a trade. I think I think of trades as providing services with your skills that require physical labor, I guess. So basically anything that has to be done for somebody with physical labor, I would call a trade. I actually can think of two uh, friends of mine in particular, they're both brothers. One of the brothers owns a landscaping business. So he basically bought himself a large lawnmower and a trailer and he runs around in most people's lawns and blows their leaves out and stuff. And he is completely self-employed, raising two kids by himself and making good money doing it. I don't know exactly what he's making on it. He's not in the FI community, so we don't ask what our net worth is. His younger brother is a plumber who went to a vocational high school to be a plumber, got out of high school almost with his license, worked for a plumbing business for a little while until he did get his license and then went out on his own. And he is absolutely crushing the game. I mean, he is definitely making six figures. So we're in Massachusetts. He goes out to Martha's Vineyard, which is a very high-end community for the summer. He he found some connection out there. And so he'll go out there and spend the summer out there making three times what he makes in our area and then bring that money back. And the rest of the year, he's working here making still very good money. Wow. That's incredible. It seems to me that it's so important to find these little inefficiencies, these opportunities, which, you know, sometimes they change over time. I really appreciate you being able to highlight that story. The other thing that really came to mind is in particular with traits, it's honestly, that's almost unfair because it's so many businesses, but anything where you are the brand, where you're representing the brand, the quality is a direct reflection of what you're bringing to the table the value of community and network. Have you seen how network has affected your ability to have this sort of income? Absolutely. The more trades that I network with, the more jobs I get through them. I mean, talking with realtors has been huge for me. I have a few realtor clients that send me little jobs. They're usually pretty small, but there's a lot of them and they make good money. And so having them in my network has really proved useful. Also, having other trades in my network, not only do I get to send them work because I'm constantly being asked if I know a good plumber or a good handyman or a roofer or whatever, they're also sending me work because they're being asked if they know a good electrician. And on top of that, if I have an issue that goes wrong in my house, I mean, Captain DIY here, I should be able to fix everything, (laughs) but believe it or not, I can't. (laughs) I want to know what is the last thing that Captain DIY outsourced? (laughs) I have to replace my boiler because my boiler is probably older than dirt. So (laughs) I am outsourcing that. There's no way I'm going to replace my boiler. The last time I tried to fix my boiler, I almost blew up my house. So (laughs) that's, yeah, that's being outsourced. So Tenny, you're talking about these, these connections and these relationships. And, and we talk about that obviously all the time here on the podcast, just how crucial it is for a successful life. In your specific profession, how have you built these relationships with people in other trades jobs, like on the ground? Are you happening to work with them on projects and just build relationships? Do you know these people outside of work specifically? Like if you could think in your mind's eye of a couple of people, how you've built those relationships? There's a few different ways that I've built these relationships. When I was working for a contractor, a lot of the work I was doing was installing furnaces and boilers with HVAC companies and plumbers and installing HVAC systems, you end up working very closely with these tradespeople. So, you know, I'm sitting side by side with them in the attic, wiring an air handler while they're doing all their duct work. And so I get to make connections that way. Also, just being in the trades, it's it tends to be a fairly close community. I mean, I I run into people all the time at supply houses and things like that, or hardware stores where, you know, Joe, the plumber is going in to get his parts while I'm standing there next to him. And it's pretty easy to strike up a conversation because we have something in common. And so that's ending up really expanding my network quite a bit. Tenny, and this has been great. And I've loved kind of walking through this. There is an incredibly viable path to a well above median income 
job here. It's so attainable for people that are just exposed to this information. You don't know what you don't know until you do. That's what this episode was for me. But what I want to go back to right now is your path, not to the trades, but to FI as a trades person. This is something that we started the episode by saying it's not reflected and we highlighted maybe a couple reasons why, but you did find the FI community. How, how did that happen? So I was never a saver. I, I was straight up, like we talked about earlier, in the trade community, if I made money, that meant I could spend it. My wife is the opposite. She was a natural saver right from the start. So when my wife got pregnant with my son about eight years ago, she decided that we needed to have $20,000 saved up by the time he was born. And so that kind of started our savings initiative. So we really cut back our expenses and put all the money we could into the bank. Of course, we didn't really know what we were doing with it. So fast forward about a year and a half ago, you know, up here in New England, it gets pretty snowy in the wintertime. So it was a February day. My wife decided to go out for a walk. She made it about 100 yards from the house before I got a call from her. She had fell on some ice and she hit her head hard. She got a severe concussion. She couldn't look at screens or read for well over a month. Uh, she Doctors told her not to think, which she's a mental health professional. So it's pretty hard, pretty hard to not think for a month. And so the only thing she could do was listen to podcasts. So being a little bit financially minded, she somehow found her way to the Mad Scientist podcast. And so she introduced me to that. And that kind of blew my mind. And I dove into the rabbit hole head first. And so the next thing I found was the Choose FI podcast. And from there, we just, we went in whole hog. So let's talk about what whole hog means for uh, two individuals in New England. So you've definitely focused on the earn more side of the equation. We've highlighted how powerful that is for you. Let's talk about kind of how you're tackling this game of financial independence, what levers you're pulling and what your plan is to reach financial independence. Sure. So one thing that we've done is in order to mitigate childcare costs as much as possible, we have kind of found ways to split up our schedules. So my wife started a private practice as a therapist about a year or so ago. She works in the evenings. She sees clients when I get home from work. So she's able to be home with the kids during the day. And then I get home from work. We tag team. She goes off to her job and I take over the kids. And then she's home a little bit after their bedtime. So it's it's a little bit of ships passing in the night kind of thing, but we're still able to see each other a little bit. So that that process has really been able to help us cut down our costs quite a bit. Also, what we've done is just learning so many tips from the financial independence community about how to save money on groceries and all these other things. And it's it's basically just optimizing our lives as much as possible. Tinny, you described their kind of like ships passing in the night, but you also described earlier how you have this day job at a university but you have this side business where you're turning down more jobs than you accept. Is there ever a thought to potentially leaving the day job at the university to build maybe like a better FI lifestyle as you get farther down the path? So my alarm clock goes off at 5.15 every morning and at 5.16 every morning, I'm thinking of business plans and how I can create my own business and not work there anymore. So yeah, every single day, yes? does that, does every that single day like I'm yes. thinking about this. <laughs> Let the oh, scheming so, begin. I'm with you, man. <laughs> <laughs> so let's hear about the scheming though, right? What does that look like? You know, leaving your day job is not an easy thing. What has to happen before that could become a reality? So I would need to speak with a few different people who know more things than I do about things like health insurance and overhead costs, just to know exactly what my minimum income would have to be to cover my business and my family needs. You know, right now I work for a state university, which means I have state benefits, which are great. So I have great health insurance, vision, dental, all of that. I also have paid time off, which is something you don't get when you own your own business. So I would have to be able to make enough money to cover those things and then still be able to make enough money to support the family. So really what that brings up in the, the FI path brings me back to a great talk that uh, Doc G gave at Camp Phi South recently. What he was talking about was there's several different paths to Phi, and one of those paths can be put your nose to the grindstone, you know, sit down, do your work for 10 years, and just crank it out and wake up when you're at Phi, and now you can live your life. The other path is, or one other path, I should say, is 
learning how to love the journey. And so finding work that fulfills you and gives you identity and connection would be a crucial piece of that. And so as a self-employed tradesperson, I think that work would give me some of that connection, certainly because I'm meeting new people all the time and that identity, because if you own the business, it is a huge part of your identity. So it might not get me to a fine number as fast if I were to do that. In fact, it would certainly not get me there as fast, but I might not want to get there as fast. I love that level of introspection. It is about this journey, right? And we all have to decide for ourselves, what's the best life. You have people, and, and hopefully there aren't too many of them in the FI community that, that like to say, oh, this is the only way. I reject that entirely. So I love that you're thinking about this, and it sounds like thinking about it on a daily basis and, and trying to understand what's the best life for you and your family. And Brad, I kind of want to turn this on you just for a second, just to kind of get your input here. So Tinian's kind of at this inflection point that I think you and I have both been in, but because you're the accountant, I would love for you to kind of weigh in for a second. Put yourself in Brad's shoes two to three years back and you're, and you're scheming, you're making the exact same scheming plans that, that Tinian is. Is there any additional thoughts, input, advice, or numbers that you would want before pulling the trigger on that? Yeah, that's, that's hard. I mean, I think Tinian hit it on the head there saying he needs to get an understanding of what his life will cost after he makes this change because it's easy to say oh my yearly expenses are x but as he so aptly said there's health care to consider there are other items to consider as a business owner right like it might not just be hey here's my gross hourly wage and i need to multiply that by 23 okay, I only need to work 23 hours to cover all my, my life expenses. There are other things that you need to consider like insurance probably, and maybe hiring other people to work with you. So you need to think as a business owner. So while I can't really dive into the specifics, of course, of Tinian's exact future business, I can say he's certainly on the right track of understanding what that life looks like after you've made that decision. I think that's the crucial piece to understand. And in the interim, Tinian, have you started to be able to build for yourself any sort of significant financial runway where if the, you know, you didn't make another dollar, you would be okay for a period of time? Absolutely. Yeah. My wife's heavy savings initiatives have really lived on and working for the university gives me access to a 457 as well as a 403B, which has been really helpful. And I've just, I mean, I'm kicking myself now because I, <laughs> I've been there for almost six years and I started it a year and a half ago. Oh man! But I was taking $0 paychecks for a little while just so I could max out my 457 and 403B last year. And uh, it's thanks to that savings that we've been doing beforehand that I was able to do that because we, we lived off what we had in the bank while I was getting those $0 paychecks. And your wife is clearly the unsung hero here. I just want to give a shout out to her. <laughs> she signed you up for those emails, unbeknownst to you. She had this $20,000 savings goal before the birth of your first child. She turned you on to FI. I mean, this is, this is incredible. Brad, so, are you uh, thinking that we need to like have her and Mrs. Slowly sipping coffee on a panel <laughs> next year? That, that was my exact <laughs> thought. My literally exact thought. It's, it's I think amazing. that would be quite an amazing panel. Okay. <laughs> like let's life goals. We're going to try and set that up for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, Captain DIY, what is the best way? Someone's listening to this and their mind just got, their, their entire universe just got a little bit bigger and they want to connect with you. They want to find out more about the work that you've been doing, both in the tradescraft, but also the stuff that you've been writing about. What is the best way for someone to connect with you? You can always find me at my blog, which is DIY2Fi.com, two being the number two. And I'm also pretty active on Twitter at DIY Captain. You know, you could probably also find me on Facebook. I'm not as active on Facebook, but uh, Tinian Crawford on Facebook. That's basically the extent of my social networking. So probably the best way if somebody wanted to really get in touch with me would be send me a message on Twitter. All right. Well, on most shows, that would be the end of the episode. But on this show, we would love to give you the chance to tackle the hot seat. Captain DIY, are you ready for this? I am so ready. In a world. Drowning in debt and rampant consumption. Trapped by the chains of lifestyle inflation. These questions highlight the secrets of those who have broken free. Welcome to the Choose FI Hot Seat.
All right. Question number one, your favorite blog that's not your own. Recently, I discovered a blog called The Burrito Bowl Diaries, which <laughs> I've really been having fun with because the guy who writes it is just hilarious. He has a sense of humor very close to mine. So it, it just really tickles me the right way. Yeah, you're right. You guys do have a very similar writing style or the way kind of the way you frame things, a very light layer of cynicism, although I think he notches it up a little bit over you, but it, it is a very yeah. enjoyable read for sure. <laughs> if he had a Twitter and, account, I would follow it. No doubt about it. He does. He just started one. <laughs> all right. I'm going to add it onto the list today. All right. Question number two, your favorite article of all time. Now this can be one that you wrote or somebody else's. So uh, I recently met Saving Sherpa at Camp Fi. Uh, SavingSherpa.com. And he's got a great article called Eliminating the Excuse, which is all about eliminating all of the things, the obstacles that we put in our way to prevent us from making progress. I mean, everybody has excuses, right? And there's so many of them that we can use to stop us from doing things that might feel a little bit uncomfortable. And so that article just really, it, it's a great way of talking about getting around it. Yeah, cutting down on friction in your life to make actual change and to take action, that's that's huge. So yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. All right, Tinny, and question number three, your favorite life hack. I have recently finally decided to come up with a regular posting schedule on my blog. So I'm, I'm trying to do it Mondays and Thursdays. What I found to work really well for me, and not just in the blog, but in other aspects, is self-imposed deadlines. So I post on Mondays and Thursdays. So what I told myself is when I'm posting Monday's blog post, I need to have Thursday's blog post scheduled that day. That's my deadline. What that's done for me is it's really made it possible for me to keep up with this schedule because I make myself get it done. I have this deadline. If I don't make the deadline, I'm in trouble with myself, but it's working. Very cool. All right. Question number four, your biggest financial mistake. A few years ago, this was before we found the Financial Independence Network, we had this nest egg that we were sitting on and we knew we had to do something with it because it's sitting there in the bank going nowhere. We saw everybody making money in the stock market and we said, hey, let's get into that. And so we had a financial advisor through the local credit union that we were part of. We gave him our money. It was two options. You can either invest regularly or you can invest with a social conscience and being socially conscious people as we are, we went for the socially conscious choice. Yeah, what's, what's the downside? <laughs> exactly. What could possibly go wrong? So then, of course, we got to sit there and watch our money go down while everybody else was making money during three years of a bull market. Eventually, once we found the community, of course, we pulled all our money out and did it ourselves, and, and it's just been up from there. But that was definitely a pretty good mistake was, was listening to this guy. Yeah, so you walk into the local financial advisor and they give you two options of, hey, regular investing and socially conscious. That was it. Those are your only two options. That was pretty much it. And it was that or, or Roth versus traditional. And we didn't know what either one of those were. We didn't know what the difference was. So he's, well, I don't know. What do you think? And, and he said, well, this is this is the best way to do it. And we'll put it in here and just that'll be that. And I'll take my money out of it every quarter. Now I can, I can already feel the feedback and the criticisms coming that, Hey, you guys were a little too harsh on social investing or socially positive investing. And, and I'm not saying this is not a slam on that in particular, but I think for me, it highlights the power of just doing about 20 to 40 hours of research on your financial life and what things like index funds actually mean. Just like the very, very basics of investing. And it's worth millions of dollars to you over your investing career. Just like, just being willing to invest something as small as 20 to 40 hours cumulative over your entire lifetime could be worth a million dollars. It's just, that's kind of like my takeaway from this. Does that sound fair, Brad? Yeah, it definitely does. Or even less time than that, frankly. Just read The Simple Path to Wealth and read a book by Jack Bogle. The Little Book of Common Sense Investing. I think those would give you a pretty good background. And yeah, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Clearly, we're not ripping on socially conscious investing or socially conscious anything. It's just I like to personally keep my investing simple and for the long term. And then if I want to do things that help the environment or help the world, I can do those on my own time. So I think that's where I was coming from with that. 100%. All right. Now, how about this? Question number five, advice you would give your younger self. Oh, start investing earlier. I had no idea how investment worked. And I had no idea that you could do investing without really knowing what you're doing. You know, investing is kind of a big, scary topic if you don't know anything about it. And doing some research, like you guys said, just doing 
a tiny amount of research at some point in my early 20s and i i would be in such a different place right now but you know hindsight bias there's the know-it-all syndrome you, you can't can't figure out everything in the in the moment well it makes you more relatable does that does that make does that make up for it <laughs> i'll take it <laughs> that's what i tell myself too that's right <laughs> that lost decade a lot more relatable <laughs> exactly no but i mean in addition to that guys not to beat yourselves up what we say on the podcast all the time is Sure, it would have been great to live this perfectly optimized life, but you make the best decisions you can at the time, and now you have better information. And you might still decide 10 years from now, oh, maybe this information was quote unquote wrong, but you're making the best choices you have at the time, and you're going forward, you're taking action, you have a savings rate, right? These are the important things. So, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. This is, I guess, what I'm trying to say here. <laughs> Thank you, Brad. You know, I feel if, much if better. If I could, I'd like to just add in addition to that, the definition for hindsight bias that we found, which is, I think is just great, is the inclination after an event has taken place to see the event as having been predictable, despite there having been little or no objective basis for predicting it. Oh, yeah. That definitely needs to get added to the show notes for perpetuity. That's fantastic. Tinian, we do have a bonus question for you. Over the past 12 months, what single purchase did you make that has brought the most value to your life? I like to work out. I built a gym in my garage and I was using it for a while and I didn't really know what I was doing all that much. But I found this guy, Brian Alsru on YouTube. He's out of Maryland. And he's Maryland's strongest man. And he, he puts on these great YouTube videos with all kinds of perfect content for people who want to grow themselves. And so I bought a workout program from him about ooh, six months ago. That program pushed me beyond anything I ever could have done by myself. I mean, it was it was so hard and it was so intense and it was so fun that it, it just got me to a totally different place in my life. So that is is definitely my my most valuable purchase. And that was it was one hundred and fifty dollars. It was money well spent. Wow. Cool, man. I'll check it out. Uh, hey, can you do me a favor? So you're Captain DIY, but we didn't actually talk about a lot of DIY stuff. Could you join us on our Friday episode this week to give us some tips and strategies for someone that's trying to get a little bit better with DIY? Absolutely. I'd love to. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much for being willing to come on the show and share your story with us. This has been a blast. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Brad, I think this was an incredibly valuable conversation. We know that there's something here. We know that this is a powerful opportunity, but it's one that hasn't been highlighted nearly enough. And I think that's what we're trying to do increasingly is show the diversity of paths that people are following to crush the game. Oh, yeah, you're absolutely right. And obviously, we do not try to throw college under the bus. I mean, Jonathan and I both went to college and it worked out exceedingly well for us but there are other paths. And that's the important point here, right? We've highlighted Treehouse and the ability to learn coding in well under a year. And now we've talked to Tinian, who is describing these trades jobs where you can make a significant salary. And he went to a one-year program. And now obviously he had the apprenticeship after that, but he was earning money during that time. Of course, not, not what he's earning five to 10 years down the road, but that is a path for people who maybe college just isn't the right fit, right? There are millions of jobs in the trades, and I think that is a very viable path to FI. All right, my friends, if you got value from this episode, if you've been getting value from the episodes up to this point, just take one second and press the subscribe button on the platform you're listening to this on. It just lets the providers know you're getting value from the show and you want to be here when we produce additional content. If you want to support us and what we're doing here at Choose FI, here are four easy ways. One, leave us an iTunes review. If you want to do that, just go to chooseify.com slash iTunes. Two, use our page to sign up for travel credit cards. If you want to travel the world with miles and points instead of your hard-earned dollars, then just go to chooseify.com slash cards and get started today. Three, if you're working on the milestones of FI, set up a personal capital account to track your progress and use our affiliate link. It's completely free and just go to choosefi.com slash PC. P is in Paul, C is in Cat. And four, and most importantly, find your friends, coworkers, and family members who might be open to this message and tell them about the podcast. Have them start with episode 38, The Why of FI, and right behind that, have them go listen to episode 21, The Pillars of FI. It is a fantastic starting place. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. You've been listening to Choose FI Radio Podcast, where we help middle-class America build wealth one life hack at a time.